Welcome back for my Comet Neowise update. This is Michael, and after a few nights of getting up at 4 a.m., it's time to share some of my early pictures, video, and some updated information, because it's almost time for Neowise's Encore. I'll just come right out and say it. I'm a bit caught off guard about how bright C2020 F3 Neowise turned out to be. Rather than a few smudgy morning glimpses early on, and a photogenic comet meant for expert photographers in the evening later in the month, this has been a delight for nearly everyone in the Northern Hemisphere to witness with our own two eyes, and the show began a bit earlier than I expected too. So I'm very glad we have an overachiever this time. For Southern Hemisphere observers, it's going to be a bit of a long wait before Neowise makes a proper appearance, and it might be tough to spot for a variety of reasons, which I'll discuss in a minute. So what comes next exactly, and what do I mean by an encore? Well, first, in the latest photographs, Neowise has sprouted an electric blue ion tail. These are oxides of carbon blasted away in solar wind, which also contains energy that lifts electrons into a higher state in this gas. Gas. And when these electrons relax again, they release beautiful blue light, not unlike how neon lights work. And to be honest, I've been waiting to see a comet like this for over two decades. And while Neowise is no hail bop by size or just how crazy long everyone was able to watch it, some of the images of Neowise we may see in the following days might rival some of the best film camera stills we saw more than 20 years ago, albeit for a very short period of time in mid-July. Taking a look at the comet's orbit, I can describe a little better exactly what's changing. Neowise originally appeared below the plane of the ecliptic, that is, from below the Sun and the Earth, and on pretty much the opposite side of the Sun. Comets coming from this angle relative to the Earth can be a bit tougher to gauge exactly how bright it might get as it approaches the Sun. This is partly why Neowise is overachieving. As the comet neared perihelion, or its closest to the Sun, it brightened remarkably, reaching as high as magnitude zero or even beyond. For comparison, this is not far from the brightness of the naked eye planets, save for the brightest one, Venus. But now, Neowise is rounding over the top of the plane of the ecliptic and gave us the nice morning shows we've been enjoying over the past week or so. Extremely long period comets that approach the sun this closely, just like Neowise is doing, really cruise fast through the inner solar system. So in just a matter of days, it will go from roughly Mercury's distance from the sun to Earth's distance, or 1 AU. During this time, it's also switching from being to the Earth's east, or sunrise side, to the west and up above, back to the sunset side of Earth, where it will become visible in the evening instead. As of this video, or July 12, Neowise is just now making this transition to the evening side of Earth, and this will be Neowise's encore performance. Starting around July 13th, Neowise should be visible as a magnitude 2 comet in the northwestern sky between the horizon and the bowl of the Big Dipper. Even better, we will lose the moon's glare as well during this time. Assuming the comet maintains this magnitude 2 to 3 status in the days ahead, and there's no reason to think it shouldn't, this would be the most optimal time to photograph comet Neowise, but even though it's still considered naked eye visible, it'll soon be best to be far away from city lights this time. Something you should do right now is find a nearby dark sky location. You don't have to be too picky though. This is a fairly bright comet, especially in mid-month. Check out darksightfinder.com. I recommend finding a place in the dark yellow or better zones. Since the comet will be to your north, it's best to avoid metropolitan areas directly to your north. Using Minneapolis as an example, take a drive up Interstate 35, about an hour north of town, for pretty good results. The goal is to get out of the harshest city lights and avoid bright light domes to the north and west where the comet will be. The charts I'm displaying here are based on the US, most of Europe, and Central Asia's latitudes. If you are further north or south than this, you might want to get a free star chart app that can show you the comet's position and when and where to look. But don't worry, it won't be that much different than this. These are also set for about one and a half to two hours after sunset, which for most people in these same regions will mean a completely dark sky free of evening twilight. On July 15th, at first you'll be looking really close to the horizon in the northwest just five degrees up, in fact. That's only the height of your outstretched fist. The constellation most familiar to people in the Northern Hemisphere near Neowise is the Big Dipper. Use the Big Dipper to orient yourself to face the right direction, then look down toward the horizon. Make sure you don't have anything obstructing your view any higher than your fists. So early on, you'll want to stay away from trees, tall mountains, buildings, or anything else that might obstruct your view. Then again, if you put yourself in the right place, you can use objects like these to frame up a nice, pleasing, wide photo op. For most people in the Northern Hemisphere, the comet will only be visible for a short time before setting below the horizon. Then each evening, Neowise will drift to the west 
and be just a little dimmer than the night before, but the comet will have some more hang time. Neowise is at its closest to Earth between the 19th to 23rd of July, but closest is pretty relative. It'll still be more than half the distance the Earth is from the Sun and scooting well above Earth's orbit, so it's still an absurdly far distance away. Neowise will likely have dimmed to about magnitude 3.5 around this time, so this is about as bright as the stars in the Pleiades cluster, or Megrez, the dim star connecting the handle of the Big Dipper to the bowl. This is still pretty good for any comet, especially one enjoying the lack of twilight and moonlight. Keep using the Big Dipper to find Neowise, this time directly below the bowl. If you don't intend to photograph the comet, bring some binoculars for a better view. A telescope, even small ones, might still be overkill, but give that a try too if you have one. Reach for your widest eyepiece so you can see more of the comet all at once and at the brightest your scope will muster. By late in the month of July, Neowise will have moved quite far away from the sun and start gaining distance from the Earth again. It's hard to say exactly how bright Neowise Eyes will still be at this point. Comets can do weird things sometimes, but will still be a fairly easy target for photographers either way. It'll also be nearly due west now. Look below the handle of the Big Dipper and just to the left. By then, southern hemisphere observers will hopefully be able to catch a glimpse in the evening northwestern sky around July 29th, give or take a few days, depending on your latitude. Neo Eyes will be in a better position to view each successive night from southern latitudes. However, moonlight will really begin to interfere, just as Neo Eyes is also darkening to that edge of naked eye visibility. So for south of the equator, it's going to be a wait and see game and probably a bigger challenge to appreciate Neowise. Keep an eye on the progress of the comet and hope for the best. To track Neowise, I use Cartes du Ciel. It's totally free, but a little more geared for the advanced sky watcher. For something more simple, use spaceweather.com's custom maps. They update these daily and you'll get a fresh picture of Neowise every single day to appreciate or give you some fresh ideas. For phone apps, I'm certain many work great, but I've been seeing friends of mine use Stellarium Mobile, which seems to work well for them. If you're still not sure, I do respond to my comments and I also have a Discord. Head down to the comments for a link to my Discord, or just drop me a line. So now let's talk photography. YouTube videos, your Twitter feed, maybe even Facebook. Maybe you've tried already the last few mornings and didn't get the results you were looking for. How are all of these comet photos being produced? What techniques are being used? Now, I can't make you an expert photographer, or for that matter, astrophotographer, in less than five minutes. But I'll share with you some of my best tips to get you on the fast track. While I did manage to capture Neo Eyes the other morning using my iPhone 11, I'm not going to win any awards with a photo like this. And comets of this size and brightness are not well suited to using a telescope. The best comet photos you're likely to see in the coming days are going to be taken with a DSLR camera with a short telephoto lens and just sitting on a simple tripod. Even this small telescope has quite a narrow field of view, so it'll be quite tough to fit Neowise into the field of view of most telescopes until the very end of the month. With a much wider field of view, you can get the best shots. You don't necessarily need a tracking mount either. Just a nice camera, a tripod, and a good telephoto lens, like this 135mm right here. When I say DSLR, I also mean mirrorless cameras with interchangeable lenses. Also, bridge cameras, or DSLR-like cameras, like the RX-10 you're watching me on now, will work pretty good too. These two Canons are over 10 years old, and I've been taking much more difficult comet pictures with these over that time. And you can find these camera bodies used for sometimes less than $200. Even cheapy kit lenses like these should suffice early on. So if you're brand new to this, don't worry too much about big budget lenses or gizmos. If you're looking to graduate to a bit more advanced setup, watch this video where I break down simple budget astrophotography that can still produce very good results. It just requires some practice and some good planning. This is exactly the equipment that I'll be using later this month, and I've already been using it to photograph several much dimmer comets than Neowise, so check that out if you want. Lenses between 100 and 400 millimeter are going to give you the best results throughout the month of July. But the longer you go, the shorter your exposure times will need to be before you get star trails. So if you're just getting into this, go with the shorter lenses first. So tripod, good camera, and a 100 millimeter or higher lens. That'll do the job. Learn to use manual mode on your camera and definitely experiment. All kinds of things will affect what settings you ultimately should use, like light pollution, how noisy your camera is with higher ISO settings, the lens you are working with. My best advice is that you can never really take too many pictures with a digital camera, and don't be afraid to experiment. Many of my photos here were taken with a Canon 6D Mark II full-frame camera, 135mm lens at f4, and ISO 5000, and a shutter speeds of around 2 to 3 seconds. Later in July, I'm betting I'll be taking closer to 5 second images with the setup, since I won't have to worry about twilight washing out the image, and I can capture more of the comet's long icy tail and new ion tail. The 4K videos were taken on an RX-10 Mark IV, zoomed in all the way to 600mm to get a nice glimpse of the comet's core. 
Focusing on a dark, starlit sky is harder than you think if this is your first attempt. Autofocus probably won't work, and focusing through the viewfinder isn't much better. My method is to start by finding a bright star or a distant street light to point at, and then use the camera's live view to manually adjust the focus until the star is as tiny as possible. If you can digitally zoom in on live view, that's even better. Then find a dimmer star and fine tune your focus until you think it's as perfect as it's going to get. Side note, if your lens has stabilization, shut it off. You don't need it and it might wreck your photo in this case. Always shoot any sort of astrophotography in RAW mode or RAW plus JPEG. The RAW file contains the actual data that came out of the camera's sensor and you'll get better results if you work with these. Even if you don't plan to use the RAW file right away, you may someday wish you had it. Some cameras are actually known for their ability to eat stars when outputting a JPEG file. So go raw. Use a remote shutter or intervalometer or the camera's built-in timer. If you don't have a way to take a picture without touching the camera, use the timer delay mode to allow all of your gear to stop shaking before the picture is actually taken. Don't just take one picture. Take many. Even if you don't have the time, money, or energy right now to go crazy with post-processing your images by stacking and using Photoshop, future you will thank past you for taking lots of pictures. Use all the same settings and without reframing the image or moving your tripod, Pod. Take lots and lots of pictures. Find the settings and framing you like, and then take about 10 pictures at a time of the exact same thing. And that leads us to stacking. Using several images of the same target, align them and stack them to create a cleaner, less noisy, higher fidelity final image. I would need a long time to explain stacking, and there are lots of YouTube videos on the subject. Comets require special care and effort over typical tripod astrophotography images. The stars are moving, and the comet is moving relative to the stars. But make no mistake, many of the best images you're seeing of Comet Neo eyes probably had some stacking done like this to make a better image, increase contrast, or pull out more detail. In fact, it's how I was able to pull the detail out of the ion tail in the comet with some early morning images taken on July 10th. Again, feel free to ask questions in the comments below. Join my Discord and come chat with us. And for regular updates, new pictures, and videos going forward, you can subscribe here or check out any of these places listed below. I hope to see you out there. Stay safe and clear skies.